What's going on guys? Josh here from Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And today we are continuing our series on the model myth, also known as the hero's journey, also known as the fool's journey. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with those terms, please check out my video that I did. I'll leave a link to it down below. It's essentially an overview of the model myth and it tells you all the key things that you need to know. But today's video is number three in the separation phase. And we've already talked about the purpose of the separation phase. We've talked about the, the steps of the separation phase. Now what we're gonna discuss is the, the key characters that most of the time you're going to come across in the separation phase or act. Now, the main thing I want to keep in mind, I want everyone to keep in mind is I'm going to do an entire different video on archetypes. But today we're just going to talk about what characters will you run across in this story format. And in the separation phase, you're going to run across a couple of them. You're going to run across, of course, your hero, normally your villain, you're also going to have a herald, you'll have a mentor, you'll have threshold guardians, and I would say that about sums it up. There may be more, but that's probably that's probably it. If I think of any, I'll we'll we'll address those. So now let's kind of get into it. Who is the hero? Well, there are several different definitions of what a hero is. Some people may call it a protagonist. Other people may call it a main character. I truly believe that a hero can be both depending on what that person is doing. So let me explain. A protagonist is the person that drives the story. Their desires, their mission, their goals drive the story forward. A main character, however, is someone that the audience sees the story through their eyes. A hero, on the other hand, and this is where there's such a nuance to all these words, a hero is someone who goes from the ordinary world to the, the special world, sacrifices something, their time, their life, it could be anything, retrieves the boon or reward, then returns back to the ordinary world to share that reward, boon, knowledge, elixir, whatever you want to call it, with the rest of the people in the ordinary world. So when I say that both a protagonist or a main character can, can be a hero, what I mean is, it, it depends on what your protagonist is doing or what your main character is doing as to whether or not they're fulfilling that hero function. So let me give you an example. Although Obi-Wan Kenobi is the main mentor in the Star Wars films, or at least in the first one, Yoda kind of takes his place later on, he is initially, actually initially, Princess Leia is the protagonist because it's she is the one who gives the mission to the droids who then give the mission to Obi-Wan. But then Obi-Wan passes that mission to Luke and he says, Luke, I'm getting too old for this kind of thing. I need you to come with me to Alderaan. And it's at that point where two batons are being tossed. One, the protagonist is transitioning from Obi-Wan to Luke, but also the hero baton is transitioning from Obi-Wan to Luke. So that now Luke must carry both of those roles, particularly when Obi-Wan dies at the hands of Darth Vader. Then the transition is complete. Luke must fulfill the rest of the, of the purpose of the journey. When we look at, pardon me, I have something in my eyes. When we look at Lord of the Rings, however, 
I'm sorry, if, if we look at The Hobbit. This is a great example where you have a protagonist and a main character. And the protagonist is mainly Thorin, Oakenshield. However, the main character, the character that we see the world through their eyes and that we relate with the most, is Bilbo Baggins. And Bilbo is the one who carries out the hero function. Even though they all go on the quest, they all slay the dragon, they all fight the orcs and all of this other stuff, Bilbo is the one that takes the boon, the knowledge, the, the lesson learned from the special world and brings it back to the ordinary world in the Shire. And we know this because when he comes back, he's a changed person. He's different. Not only does he bring Sting and some of his other treasures back with him, but he literally comes back changed with a different perspective on life and, in, and, and a knowledge in fullness of life that he would have never had before had he not gone on that journey. So, that is the hero function. The, the next function we can talk about is, here we go, I didn't even think about this, the sidekick. A lot of times you'll meet sidekicks in the ordinary world. This is normally the person that's closest to your main character, to your hero. So, Toto is Dorothy's sidekick in Wizard of Oz. So we meet Toto and we see that Toto represents Dorothy's instinct, instinctual primal thought process. So when we meet Toto in the beginning, we, we see that normally the sidekick also represents like this is the way that the character, the, the hero, is most accustomed to thinking and as we see though along the way Dorothy picks up the scarecrow the tin man and the lion she then starts to pick up new sidekicks and allies and she starts to gravitate to them as well whereas initially when she was more of a child in the beginning of the story she just focuses on her her feelings and her instincts and her primal emotions so, if you wanted to look at it in an opposite way, when Luke, when we first meet Luke, he is surrounded by droids that think very narrow-mindedly. You could even put C-3PO on that list. But also, his uncle and Aunt Beru, who are very mother-hen, type attitude. They're very protective. They, they, they are very simple. And so it gives you an idea of who Luke is as a character, where he's coming from, based on the people who surround him. So that's the sidekick function. Now if we look at the Herald, the, one of the key steps in the monomyth is that the hero receives a call of adventure. Well, where does that call come from? Nine times out of ten, it's going to be from a Herald. Now that doesn't mean that it can't come some other way or method. Sometimes it's an amorphous energy or it could be by an email, we'll say. That, that could be the call to adventure. There is no real herald, whoever wrote that, but maybe we never see the email. A lot of times though, you're going to have a herald. And this goes back to when kings would have a herald go and send out a decree of when the ball was going to be or when a joust would be, something like that. Something to alert everyone, hey, be on the lookout for this. The herald can be, sometimes the herald can be the sidekick as well. Sometimes the herald will just have a small little part and be gone. But a lot of times the herald is also representative of the special world. In a lot of Greek mythology, what we see is Hermes as the herald coming down to the mortals and presenting some sort of will of the gods or call of adventure there. And so it, the herald can sometimes be the first glimpse of what the special world might be like.
as Joseph Campbell points out in his book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces, when I believe it's Persephone is playing around with her little golden ball in near this lake, she drops it in the water and the frog basically comes out and gives her her ball back and the frog acts as the herald. And the interesting thing that Joseph Campbell points out here is that the frog is the child fairy tale baby version of the journey's big crisis moment which is the dragon. It's the baby version of that special world monster that you're gonna face. So that's something to keep in mind. Maybe the herald in your story can can be a reflection of what is to come at a much, much smaller scale. Sometimes a mentor can also act as a herald, which brings me to the next character, which is the mentor. And as I've stated in other videos, the mentor's main function is to give the hero knowledge, give them confidence, maybe give them a map, direction, some sort of psychological cue to stay on point, tools, weapons. In, in some story analysis, mentors have been looked at as donors because they give things. And the thing is, what the mentor really represents is someone who has been to the special world and come back alive. And they understand it. They're, it's not their first go around. One of the things that Chris Vogler mentions in Chris Vogler, by the way, he wrote this book, The Writer's Journey. He mentions it in one of his talks. He says that a mentor could be someone who's crazy because crazy people have seen a part of the world that is different from us and they experience it in a different way. And if you think about it, the Cheshire Cat in... Alice in Wonderland serves as a mentor and he's very sphinx like in a way but he's also a little crazy the Mad Hatter as well serves particularly in these newer films of Alice in Wonderland as a mentor who's a little bit off but they still have these gems of wisdom that the that the hero can take on their adventure the last thing to keep in mind that Chris Vogler also points out is that sometimes it can be someone young. Sometimes the best advice comes from youth simply because they're they're unaware of the rules that exist in the world and so they're still full of this innate knowledge that we've kind of lost as it's been beaten and filtered out of us over the years. So keep that in mind with your mentors. After the mentor, we can talk about threshold guardians. They are people who are going to sort of block the path for the hero. And it's not that they are challenging them in order to fight. A lot of times it's a challenge. It's a pop quiz. It's a test to see is the hero formidable enough to go further or do they need to learn something now that will help them go along their way. So the way Joseph Campbell describes it in his book is that a lot of times the hero will absorb the threshold guardians, either their knowledge or sometimes the guardian themselves. So when we look at the, particularly the Tin Man and the Lion in, in The Wizard of Oz, we see them, they're threshold guardians in the sense that when Dorothy first meets them, she's either perplexed by them or she's scared of the lion. But as, as she meets them and absorbs them, they then become her allies and sort of new sidekicks in a way. So that each one of these threshold guardians presents a challenge that is going to prepare the hero for the special world. In addition, if they become an ally, that ally will represent a piece of the hero's psyche that they are now developing. So a lot of times, something that I picked up from Dramatica, 
which is if you if you want to check out Dramatica, it's uh, I think www.dramatica.com. It's a new theory of story. It's got some really great information on there. And one of the things they talk about when they're discussing characters and archetypes is you have you know one character that represents reason, and the other one represents emotion, and another one represents protection and skepticism. And these are all different aspects of our psyche. So as you're developing these allies and threshold guardians, keep that in the back of your mind. What aspect of your hero is that person going to develop and grow as the adventure goes on? The, the other character is the rival. Uh, and the rival can be a threshold guardian that may never truly become an ally but may help in certain ways. Sometimes the rival will challenge the hero to do things that they should be doing and they're not because they're too lazy or they're too complacent. Sometimes the rival can be working with the villain and sometimes the rival is in this squishy in-between place and again Dramatica has a really I believe great definition for this character they call that type of rival a contagonist. It's not an antagonist, but it's a contagonist in the sense that they seem to be against the hero in the beginning, but they provide some sort of help to the journey. Darth Vader is a great example of a contagonist because in the first few films, it seems as though he's against Luke Skywalker and his team, and he is, even Darth Vader believes that. But over the, over the course of the journey, he helps build a stronger team and rebellion because they're fighting against Vader. And in the end, Vader is redeemed by taking out the Emperor. So, the rival. Then, you have the Temptress, the Tempter. And this person doesn't always show up in the beginning, in the separation section of the story. But if they do, the temptation is normally to the effect of, do you really want to go out into the special world? Why don't we stay here? Why don't we stay complacent? The tempter or the temptress or who, the, the temptation itself should always be, whatever your theme is, the temptation should be against the theme. So if if your theme is that you should, for example, Star Wars theme is you should be trust your instincts and depend on yourself. Don't be dependent on other people or or machines. If that's the theme of your story, then the tempter should be someone who tempts the hero into being more dependent on those things or like I said before tempts the hero in, into trying to stay or regress back into their old way of thought so that they don't cross the thresholds that they need to go through so there may be more that I'm forgetting but in a nutshell that's it just a really quick recap hopefully I remember them all you, it, during the separation phase you're going to have your hero you're going to have sidekicks, you're going to have the herald, you're going to have your mentor, you're going to have threshold guardians, you'll have allies, rivals, tempters, and the last one that I didn't think about, which is a huge one, is a lot of times the villain. Not all the time will the villain be introduced in the separation phase. However, the introduction of the villain is very important. And the purpose of the villain or villains is to, the, the stronger the villain and the more formidable, the more fearful the audience can be of the villain, the more it makes the hero bigger and better. Because they know in the back of their minds that somehow this hero, despite all their flaws, despite all their weaknesses, is going to defeat that villain. And 
when we look at all of the stories that we've already discussed, Star Wars, where you have Darth Vader and the Emperor versus Luke and his little rabble team of rebels, it seems impossible that they could ever defeat the Empire. And yet they do. And it just, those villains help make the hero stronger in the audience eyes because they're taking on such an enormous entity when the fellowship of the ring goes out to defeat the forces of mordor and sauron and saruman there you have another one where a wizard and this demigod against just regular people of middle earth in the story of dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, she goes against the witch and, and Miss Gulch too. And for a child, an adult is this, you know, a difficult person because they have all this authority to go against. And then one other example would be Katniss Everdeen going against the Capitol and the, the president, Snow, who represents this regime of power and she's just this one person starting a revolution so the thing when you're when you're introducing your villains is to to show them and a lot of times what people what what we see writers do when they fail with a villain is they try to make them too evil having a hint of good or having a hint of something that makes the villain seem more like a real person really helps balance things out and in a lot of in a lot of well written villain is just someone who has just a slight different look on life and because of that maybe their 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 intentions are good and maybe their intentions are almost the same as the hero. They're trying to protect someone. But in order to protect that person, they go way overboard. Uh, a good example of this was in Unbreakable. Samuel L. Jackson's character, who is the main villain, his whole purpose in life was to find a hero who had those special abilities that Bruce Willis' character had. And in order to do that, he was willing to do all of these atrocious things like set bombs on trains and things like that. He wanted to do a good thing, but it was in this twisted way. So in a, in a strange way, when you see that, the audience sort of can relate with the villain as well. The villain should also have characteristics that either characteristics and qualities that your hero cannot portray or wishes to portray and that also and I, I think that Darth Vader is a good example of this for Luke Skywalker Luke is kind of this whiny little farm boy with no power Darth Vader is a very well composed ex-Jedi with lots of power and so there's there's a contrast there and then lastly what I'll say about villains is that if you take a look at Batman, the Joker is Batman's antithesis. His belief system is completely different. He believes in chaos. He believes that people will turn on each other on the, the turn of a hat. Batman, on the other hand, is fighting for the soul of his city, and he believes that people are truly good inside and will help each other in their time of need. And then, so even when the Joker is caught, he's laid this last trap where there's these two boats and there's bombs on the boats and they have to make a decision. And, and Batman ends up winning that argument. And that is also sort of the theme of the story played out between the villain and the hero. If we look at Batman Dark Knight Rises, where we have Bane, the interesting thing about Bane is... Yeah, he's this terrible guy who's come from this terrible place and, and all of this other stuff. But what we find out, the, the kind of humanizing thing about Bane is that he 
did all of the, his actions out of love for the for the real villain which is Ra's al Ghul's daughter so it's it's very interesting when we see at the end when Bane is like who seems like this extreme monster is all of a sudden very touching in a way where he had protected her when she was in the prison and, and all of this other stuff he was trying to protect that innocence and it's just that Bane believes the way Ra's al Ghul did in the sense that the city must be purified in order for its soul to be redeemed whereas Batman believes that no purification is needed that people have to come together and work together in order to find that redemption so here we are at 25 26 minutes and I think that's going to end it for us so I hope this has been helpful and if you enjoyed this video if the information has been helpful please give it a like and if you want to go ahead and subscribe and all this information will come to you as I put out more videos but until next time take it easy